I want to start today's sermon where Paula Sedita and uh, Rick Norman left off last week. If you were here, you realize that they were the preachers of the day. And they used as their preaching theme the image of the great redwood trees that can be found out in the forests of the Pacific Northwest. And they spoke of the strength of those trees, of their grandeur, the beauty of their age, some of them being 2,600 years old, and their resilience. Rick and Paula used those types of illustrations to compare the red words to Christians who seek to mature and become strong, stronger witnesses in their faith. Well, I came across a video illustration that uses red words as its theme also. It says that the grace of God is like the growth and the strength of those redwoods. I want to speak today primarily about the grace of God. But before I continue with that, let's watch the video. Today I'm in one of the most beautiful places in the world, the Redwood Forest. These trees can be 2,600 years old and predate Christ, up to 14 feet, sometimes 20 feet in diameter. These evergreens reach some 250 feet tall in the air. They're impervious to fire, pestilence, and a sense they're almost unstoppable. These redwood trees are incredible. Even when you cut down one of the redwood trees, or if they fall because of some natural reason, this is what happens. It's called a grove. Five or six grow back in its place. You know, God's grace is a lot like these trees. It is everlasting. The Bible says that the Lord loves us with an everlasting love. And even when we reject or cut down the love of God, I'm convinced that He's that more determined to love you back into his kingdom. It was the kindness of the Lord that leads me to repentance. God's grace, it is amazing. God's grace, it is indeed amazing. Before I move on to talk about God's grace, I want to be upfront with you about where I'm headed during the next three sermons and the next three Sundays. I'm going to use the next three Sundays to teach about being courageous tithers for the love of God. Courageous tithers for the love of God. Now, what is the tithe? Uh, tithing is returning to God at least 10% of that which you have acquired. And that could be 10% of your financial resources, or 10% of your time, or even 10% of your talents. Tithing is the epitome of Christian stewardship. And it is often the hardest part to achieve. So, I hope that through these sermons, you will come to realize that one of the greatest ways to open up the floodgates of God's blessing in your life is through the act of tithing. As a matter of fact, one of today's scripture lessons uh, says this in Malachi 3, bring all the tithings, or bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven, 
I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it all in. Try it. Put me to the test, says God. I like that. Put me to the test, says God. Well, with that being said, let's return to the grace of the Redwoods. I love what the narrator in our video said about grace. Remember how he described that if a redwood tree is cut down or it is destroyed for some reason or another, that out of its root system will spring up four, five, or six other trees that become a grove. And he goes on and he talks about how the tree is unstoppable, almost eternal. And then he says this, God's grace is like that. It is eternal. Well, I want to add to that. that there is so much more to it that I don't want for us to just, just move quickly beyond our understanding of what grace is. Uh, grace is never ending, but it is also always present, everlasting, and abounding in love. If you want a definition, definition for grace, here's one printed right up there. Uh, grace is the forever forgiving, unending love of God for you. The strength of God's relationship with you is found in his forever forgiving, unending love. Nothing can shake it, change it, damage it, or dispel it. Nothing can take it from you, use it all up, diminish it, or drain its power from your life. It is the soil upon which your life in Christ is planted. Grace is why Jesus left the glory of heaven to walk amongst us down here on earth. Grace is the motivator that enabled Jesus to climb up onto the cross and die for us. That grace was revealed in its power on Easter Sunday when Jesus walked out of the tomb to become the risen Lord. And grace is the most important thing God could ever give you. And he will never, ever take that away from you. There is nothing that you can do that will remove his grace from your life. You can never sin so badly that his love rejects you. No matter how often you turn away from God, God never leaves you nor abandons you. Even if you don't believe in God, God believes in you. And His grace still abounds in your life. Everything He has ever done to prove His love for us, He has done with you in mind. If you were the only person left on the face of the earth and he had to send Jesus down here to die for you, just you, he would be willing to do it all over again if that's what it takes. That's how big his forever forgiving, unending love for you is. And we call that grace. Here's another video that speaks more emotionally to the subject of God and His grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor for us, His crazy love. And the truth is, many times we struggle understanding it. If you find yourself struggling to understand God's grace, don't beat yourself up. Even the disciples struggled with understanding grace. Jesus, is that you? You're alive. I can't believe you're alive. Okay, I was in the boat and I wasn't catching any fish, okay? But I heard this voice and the voice said, cast your net to the other side. And so I'm thinking, I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing, but I'm not catching any fish, you know? And so I throw that net over there and then a gaggle of fish pop into that net and I'm going, this is a total miracle. Who could have done that? I need to know who told me to throw the net to the other side. And boom, I look up and I mean, there is you. You're looking at me on the seashore going, it is I, the Lord, and you're alive. I can't believe you're alive. <laughs> this is awesome. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on. Peter, yeah. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. I love you. You're alive. This is so great. Good. And, then feed my sheep. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on, man. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? 
I love you, yes. And I'm so sorry about that rooster cluck, and I had no idea what that meant, but I do not. I'm better for it, all right? Okay. Then feed my sheep. Andrew, I'm smiling, but I'm serious. Come on, get out of the boat. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? Jesus, mere words cannot describe the passion that I have for you. I love you. You know everything. I love you. Good. Good. Then feed my sheep. I didn't even know you had livestock. That is so like you, though. There's something new about you all the time. That's what I love about you. Peter, yeah. do you remember uh, the morning the ladies went to the tomb? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all in the upper room trying to figure out what to do next, you know, because we thought you were dead. You know, you were dead, you know, and we're trying to figure all that out, you know. And Mary comes running up, and Mary's like saying, beehive, beehive, beehive. And I'm thinking, I'm allergic to bees. Like, keep them out, you know what I'm saying? But as she kept getting closer, I heard her correctly. She was saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we're going, who's alive, who's alive? And she said, she was at the tomb, and the tomb was empty. And she said that the, there was an angel there. And the angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay, he is risen. And so me and John, we hightailed it down there. And if John says he beat me, he's totally lying, all right? I beat him, FYI, all right, you know? And we get down there and I'm looking in that tomb and it is, it is empty. There's nothing in there, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And John is right there. John is so good with words. He should write a book. He is so good with words. And John said, don't you get it, Peter? This is everything Jesus said he was going to do, and you did it, and it's done. Let's go. This is so great. Wait, yeah. the angel said what? Uh, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. You've risen. Let's go. This he is said okay. what? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. You said my name. Why did you say my name? Peter, that's grace. No, no, I don't, I don't deserve that because that night people kept coming up to me asking me if I belonged to you, if I was with you, and I kept denying you left and right, all right? No, no it'll take me my whole life to make up for what I did. It was unforgivable no, for what I did. No, What I did on the cross was meant to take what is unforgivable and make it forgivable. That's my grace. It's not about you. It's always about me. That's grace, Peter. What Jesus did on the cross takes that which is unforgivable and makes it forgivable. And that's grace. Do you understand that? Have you taken ownership of that? So how do we respond to that? Well, we return his love for us with our love for him. For example, we don't treat Christ as an afterthought. He should be the very first thought on our minds every day. We don't pigeonhole him into some part of our life over here or some little part of our life over here. We should give him our entire life, always. And we don't give him our leftovers. We choose to give him the best of everything that we have. If God gave us the best that he had to offer, and that was Jesus dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, can't we give him in return everything that we have to offer also? One of the scriptures that Suzanne read to you earlier today says this from Proverbs 3, honor the Lord. Did you hear that? Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your harvest. Do you know what the first fruits are? They are the best part of our harvest. Now, you might not harvest field crops. Very few of us harvest field crops anymore. But like I said earlier, there are other crops that we harvest in our lives. And that can include our time, our talents, 
and our treasures. So let me ask you, do you give to God the best of those? Do you give to God the best of your time? Do you give to Him the best of your talents and your skills and your abilities? Do you give to Him the best of your financial treasures? Uh, for the last three weeks or so, um, Philip and the youth and the children's department and many of you adults have helped out in the pumpkin patch. Two things happen very early each day, which maybe most of you don't realize happens out there at the pumpkin patch. Two things. The first is this. Those who show up first go around and they inspect all of the pumpkins and they throw away the ones that begin to rot. Then they turn all the other pumpkins that are sitting in the dirt, they rotate them into a different position so that they won't rot. Now why do they do that? That is done because we want people to take home the very best that we have to offer. 